A Health and Safety Management System HSMS, is a systematic approach put in place by an employer to minimize the risk of injury and illness. It involves identifying, assessing, and controlling risks to workers in all workplace operations. An effective HSMS is a key component of any business, its scope and complexity will vary according to the type of workplace and the nature of its operations. For all workers and organizations, health and safety should be an expressed value. Studies show that organizations committed to health and safety excellence achieve success through a strong HSMS. Many benefits are associated with the development and implementation of an HSMS. Most importantly, an effective HSMS can help prevent injuries and property loss, reduce costs, and support due diligence, legal compliance. Developing a proactive approach to health and safety through an HSMS and its essential elements results in long-term financial social benefits. Introduction For both development and implementation of an HSMS to be successful it needs to be based on a formal structure of defined elements. A successful HSMS includes but is not limited to the following 5-6 elements. Health and Safety Policy Organization Planning and Implementation of the Planning Evaluation of the Planning and Implementation Review of the performance after regular intervals continual improvement Independent auditing of the HSMS Health and Safety Policy H&S Policy is a basic document prepared by the senior most person, GM, owner of the business, CEO or MD that shows the intention of the company and what to achieve in the health and safety, it highlight the roles of the people who will be involved in the HSMS, and it highlight about the resources that will be putting in place to achieve the objectives of the HSMS, organization is the group of people that will be physically involved in the planning, implementation of the element of the HSMS and safety programs. They will be running the show in day-to-day -day operation of the company and maintain the HSMS and obtain the objectives, planning and implementation. At each function level in the company the responsible persons will plan for the safety programs. They will set the targets, goals and objectives for all those type of activities which helps to improve the workplace safety. These planning will be in the form of smart targets and aligns with the health and safety policy objectives. These targets and planning will be as per agreement of the relevant parties and resources of the department. Some of the plannings are number of training, number of risk assessment, number of safety inspection, number of safety meetings etc. Once planning has been finalized, then the role players will take their role and work on the planned programs. Evaluation of Planning and Implementation All role players will work and implement on the their planned activates and they will evaluation their performance. They will check their monthly performance within the department. Every quarter the department managers will evaluate their performance in the meeting with CEO. Every six months the internal audit will evaluate the performance of each department. Every one year independent audit will evaluate the whole HSMS performance, review of the performance. At each stage followed by the performance evaluation the review meetings are conducted. Monthly reviews are conducted by each department based on the outcome of the monthly performance. Quarterly reviews are conducted by each department managers and CEO based on the outcome of the quarterly performance. Annual reviews is conducted by CEO with board of directors based on the outcome of the annual performance, audits. Audits are conducted to check and evaluate the performance of the HSMS. Mainly two audits are conducted for the same of evaluation HSMS. Internal audit is conducted semi-annually by the internal auditors of the organization. Independent and external audit is conducted annually to evaluate the whole HSMS, continual improvement. 
during the review it is commented on the status of the performance. If performance is good and satisfactory, then review meeting will suggest to maintain the performance or enhance to improve it in next year. If performance is poor, unsatisfactory then review will try to explore the reasons of failure or poor performance, learn the lessons from these mistakes. Rectify the problems, fix it and plan and start implementation of the planning for next year. Risk Assessment and HSMS Managing health and safety risks require the identification of what might cause harm or loss to people or facilities, an evaluation of what is being done to prevent such mishap and the implementation of additional controls, where required, to ensure that the risks remain under control. This risk assessment process is central to any safety management system. It is the means by which we identify hazards and evaluate risks. Consider how it fits within the context of the plan, do, check, act framework for managing safety described within HSE guidance, plan, risk assessment is a proactive process whereby hazards are identified and prioritized. This enables employers to plan the implementation of controls. Do. This is the stage where actions are taken to ensure that employees and others are protected safe so far as reasonably practicable. Doing includes allocating responsibilities for risk assessment and implementing control measures, check, is a process where we measure our performance. Measuring performance will ensure that the precautions implemented as a result of risk assessment are implemented and appropriate. Act Activities should be reviewed against the risk assessment findings to ensure that all hazards were correctly identified and that any new hazards have been properly identified and is risk versus safety. Risks and safety has inverse relation. When safety controls are weak risk will high and strong. When safety controls are strong then risk will become low and weak. Therefore to control the risk. Safety controls shall be appropriate, sufficient and strong so that risk could become as low as reasonably practical, suitable and sufficient risk assessment. Identify the hazards. This is the process of identifying all the significant hazards ones that high potential of injure or harm. One approach is to take each task and break it down into steps, assessing the hazards associated with each step. Who might be harmed and how? This is the process of determining who may be at risk from the hazards, the groups of staff and others likely to be affected, evaluate the risks and decide on precautions. The term risk can be defined as the likelihood of harm and severity of accident. Action Planning The risk assessment matrix provides the results of the risk rating using likelihood times severity and gives a rough guide to the size of the risk. The risk rating should now be considered and converted into an internal action plan indicating priorities for action, record your findings. The significant findings of the assessment must be recorded including the hazards and risk controls and kept. Review your assessments and revise, as a result of new or modifications of existing equipment, building alterations, new procedures, new or modified products. The risk assessment shall be reviewed, hazard risks incidents and accident. Hazard is any object, situation, actions that has the potential to trigger an accident and may harm to the person and or damage to property or environment. Every hazard regardless of its size has likelihood of occurrence of incident and severity of the outcome of the incident. The combination of two factors, likelihood and severity. Determine the degree of the risk posed by a certain hazard. Risk evaluation is process where we find the likelihood and give a number from 1-5 and also, we find the severity and give a number from 1-5 followed by multiplying both numbers and reaching the risk value, hazard risks incidents and accident. Take an example in a given situation where we estimate the likelihood of happening the incident is 3 and if the an incident happens, 
The outcome of the incident could be serious injury that is rate for as severity. Risk equals likelihood x severity. Risk equals 3 by 4 equals 12. Followed by compare this value to risk matrix, types accidents and incidents. Any type if some unwanted event happen there might be three types of outcome. Incident, near miss, an unwanted event occurred but outcome of the event is no injury or no damage, this is an incident called near miss. Accident an unwanted event happens, outcome of the event may be injury, damage or both in this case it is called an accident, relation of risk and hazards. Hazards is anything or any situation that have the potential to cause harm, injury or dame to the property. Different types of hazards are generated by the following things. Locations, people, materials and machines. These may be called the mother of all hazards. Hazards are generated by any of the above things and hazards have a degree of likelihood of making incident if someone interact with them. Having the likelihood will trigger the incident, and every incident will have some consequence which can be graded as minor medium high, likelihood are rated 1 5 from low to high, and consequence are rated 1 5 from low to high. Then risk is calculated by the combination of likelihood and consequence. Risk equals likelihood x consequences. L equals 3 and C equals 4. R equals 3 by 4 equals 12. Classification of accidents. Hazards are existing everywhere in the workplace. All hazards have some degree of likelihood of occurring accident. Having the likelihood will trigger the incident, and every incident will have some outcome of the incident. Outcome could be one of following, incident occurred but no harm or injury or damage due to any reason. This is classified as near miss accidents. Incident occurred and worker sustained personal injury but no damage to property. This classified as injury accident. Incident occurred and damage to property but no personal injury. This is classified as damage accident. Incident occurred, personal injury sustained and damage to the property happens. This will be classified as accident with property damage and personal injury. Incident occurred, which resulted in sickness or ill health occurred, this will be classified as health incident. Incident occurred, which resulted in fatal injury. This will be classified as fatal accident. Incident occurred, regardless of its outcome, this incident must be reported to government authorities. This will be classified as dangerous occurrence. Generic and Dynamic Risk Assessments Generic assessments are assessments produced once only for a given activity or type of workplace. For example, where a company has several locations where the same activity is carried out, a single generic assessment could be done for that activity to cover all the locations. Similarly, if a company has employees who work away from base, such as electricians, then generic assessments can be used for their hazardous work rather than attempting to produce a task-based risk assessment for each activity at each location. Whilst this method of assessment has significant benefits in terms of practicability and time saving there is a major drawback that must be considered. The application of the risk control measures as identified from the generic assessment is dependent on the task actually being carried out exactly as it was assessed. Any variation in working methods, materials or equipment may have a significant impact on the assessment of risk and the required level of protection required, therefore it is essential that operators and supervisors are provided with training on the effective use of generic assessments and what actions to take when situations differ from the one assessed. Field employees who face such safety issues will therefore require training in identifying analyzing and controlling risk at the time it presents itself. These types of assessments are said to be called dynamic risk assessments.
Dynamic risk assessments rely on the development of generic assessments covering the known hazards and risks associated with the task, principle of controls. Avoiding risks not using the material, for example toxic chemicals, or carrying out the activity, for example excavations, eliminates the need for control. Evaluating the risks that cannot be avoided for these risks a suitable and sufficient risk assessment must be carried out. Combating the risks at source control the risk as close to the point of operation where the hazard is being produced. Adapting the work to the individual this measure requires the employer to carefully consider ergonomic principles and design the work to suit the person, adapting to technical progress many risks disappear from the workplace as better processes and methods are introduced. Replacing the dangerous with the non-dangerous or the less dangerous mean reduction of risks. Developing a coherent overall prevention policy this embodies the principles of risk management and requires the employer to look at all aspects of the health and safety management system rather than simply concentrating on basic workplace precautions, hierarchical approach. Hierarchical approach provide a structured hierarchy to help with the selection of control measures based on the desired protection required for differing levels of risk where the control measures at the top of the hierarchy would be considered before other, less effective measures at the lower end of the scale. Elimination or substitution, this is often the most effective way of avoiding serious risk of harm. It need total removal of hazard. Substitution means to replace the hazard for a less harmful material, use of barriers this option is achieved by introducing engineering controls. Isolation, segregation, barricades, preventing the contacts are common way of implementing these controls. Procedures and systems of work this option requires the development of safe working practices and procedures. Training Information and supervision having a competent workforce is a fundamental safety requirement. This way of control include many things such as trainings, awareness and similar other things that improve the behavior of the workers. Personal protective equipment is the last for protection of residual risks, barriers to good health and safety control. In practice, it might be technically possible to achieve total elimination of a hazard the costs involved, and the benefits achieved may mean that it does not pass the test of reasonably practicable. The methods shown later in the list of control measures are usually the cheapest options. They can be put into operation very quickly, and give some measure of risk reduction, but their effect is often of short duration. Financial The main problem with making improvements in safety is that there is little, if any, perceivable financial gain. Another financial issue that may put a constraint on any risk reduction program is a conflict of priorities, conflict of priorities where finances are restricted and budgets have been set for the coming period, a decision has to be made on what gets priority. It is often a case of making compromises and accepting that everything cannot be done today. Management perceptions It is a fact that, even today, Many managers see health and safety as a waste of time and money, or just pay no attention to it whatsoever. Resistance to change One of those other tasks mentioned above is convincing people that the changes that you are advocating are for their benefit. Very few people like change when the advantages are not obvious, how to do the risk assessment or JHA. Step 1 to carry out the risk assessment first we must see what are the hazards. Visit the area of activities and focus on the four factors. People, equipment, materials used by the workers, environment and locations of work. By seeing all these things you must point out the hazards. In the give picture, a typical work area has been shown. A worker is walking in the area. General hazard is poor housekeeping. There are pipes on working surfaces. So the hazard identified is pipes on the working surface that will be called trip hazard. Step 2, identify the people who might be harmed by the advent of an accident by the hazard. The people might be harmed may be workers, visitors, passers-by, 
or any other person who might be affected by the accident. Do not forget to identify the people who might need a special assistant in case of an accident happens. Step 3. Evaluate the risk, by seeing the likelihood and severity of the potential accident. Likelihood and severity must be ascertained by seeing the current safety controls at that time. In the given scenario the potential of, likelihood, of having an incident is significant. Likelihood, 1 2 3 4 5, in the given scenario after having the accident there must be an outcome of accident, that might be sever injury, broken bone, or minor bruises to the worker. As our common experience shows that falling in this situation will sustain medium injury. Severity, 1 2 3 4 5, by combining two of the risk factors. Likelihood equals 4. Severity equals 3. Risk is 4 by 3 equals 12. This is called the evaluation of the risk. Therefore risk is combination of the likelihood of occurring the accident and severity of outcome of the accident. Outcome of the accident may be an injury to the person or damage to the property or environment. In the given set of condition the risk is high, that mean we must suggest some more controls so that risk could become to the alarm level. When we must suggest the controls, we have to apply the hierarchy of controls as shown. Eliminate or remove the hazard, substitute the high hazardous with low hazardous, barricade or engineering controls, safety system of work, and lastly PPE. Step 4, record all the findings, and steps in formal way on the format used by the organization, show the risk ratings and reduced risks. Share the information with workers so that they can apply the requirement. Step 5. Review the risk assessment of JHA if any of the following thing changes. People, location or environment, equipment, or materials. If any legal requirements changes or an incident happens. We have to monitor to ensure that all the controls are applied during work activities, alarm or safe level of risk. Risk rating in the range of 1-5 is safe for work and must take care and can work. More than 6 we must take actions, cautions and controls to reduce the risk to a LARP level, by thinking about the money, time and cost of the reducing the risks, benefits of risk assessment. Benefits of risk assessment and improved health and safety culture with managers taking a proactive approach to risk and safety management. Fewer accidents, and less lost time through ill health. Where the working conditions within an organization have improved, these would seem to be the obvious benefits. These, in turn, will lead to fewer insurance claims and possibly lower premiums. Duties of Safety Officer Safety officer is an entry-level position in the health and safety department, this position is the backbone of the department functions. At one side safety officer interacts with the management and other side he has links with the field workers. Every company gives the responsibility to safety office depending on the way how they are functioning however there are some typical functions carried out by the safety office. Main duties of safety officers are to take care of day-to-day -day function of safety department. He takes care of the local safety of the workplace under his control. He takes the information and work instruction from department manager and apply in the workplace, this includes the procedures standards and other instruction that need to work safe, he assist to make the safety plan in the department and play his role in a implementation of the safety plan. Assist and give his input while preparing the safe system of work by the department head, this includes the assisting and risk assessment, assisting in preparation of SOPs, work permit system, any other document. He participates and plays his role in implementation of the HSMS in the company. Interpreting the safety procedures and standards for the understanding of the normal workers. 
guiding and educating the normal workers for implementation of the safety working practices, he may coordinate with the job engineer or supervisor to deliver the toolbox talks or safety briefings. Conducting he site safety inspections and audits and preparing the reports. Delivering the safety inductions for the newcomers, visitors and contractors, if there is no dedicated safety trainer, the safety officer deliver the internal safety trainings. He coordinate and assist to conduct the department safety meetings. He attends and represent the safety department in other department safety meeting, safety inspections. Safety inspection is tool that used proactively to enhance the workplace safety. It is random or planned activity where safety officer visits the place of work and note the unsafe acts, unsafe behaviors of the workers and unsafe working conditions. Observations are recorded in a form, and suggested corrective actions are recommenced with time scale and responsibility to close the actions, ways of conducting the safety inspections. Once the safety inspection is decided there are different ways to get the information regarding the unsafe working practices or conditions. Safety officer may interview the workers and employees to know the level of safety about a particular working conditions. He may have a general round of a workplace and note the unsafe working practice and unsafe condition that may affect the safety negatively. He could focus on a working activity and examine the procedure if workers are abiding by procedure requirements or not. A formal but general visit, inspection of the area of work and taking the observation related to safety violations and preparing a report of the findings. If the workplace is very big and complex, he may not have time to round all the workplace. He can use sample approach to take observation from a section of the workplace and use it as representative of the whole workplace. He can use a survey technique to find out the facts about a particular safety issue and can make a safety profile and present it in the form of a report. An informal walkthrough of the work area by the member of senior management and noting the unsafe working conditions. The most common topic to focus on. Fire safety and inspection of fire-related safety arrangement. General safety of the workplace such as housekeeping issues. General working behavior of the workers. Hazardous substance exposure and safety requirement. Welfare facility status and hygienic condition. Electric safety and condition of the electrical installation, machinery and equipment safety concerns to be inspected. Environment issues can be included as sometime they may lead to unsafe working conditions. Movement of vehicles and pedestrian unsafe conditions. Working tools and lifting accessories, equipment safety. Ladders and stairs safety. Before starting the safety inspection the safety officer must plan the inspection in coordination with his manager. If he will use the checklist. Then prepare the checklist carefully and cover all aspect of the inspection. Plan the time, target area where to conduct and the method of safety inspection. Plan and decide the scope of the safety inspection. Safety inspector must be competent and know what he has to observe and record. Inspector must have some information to raise the unsafe findings up to suitable level and follow up plan to close the actions. Risks posed by electricity. Electricity is a form of energy, if any energy is being used under control it works for the human and we take a lot of benefits from energy. Electricity is a form of energy and we use in daily life everywhere. Electricity is a hazard and if it goes out of control, the risks posed by the electricity are very high. There are main four types of risks are posed by electricity. Electrical shock. Electrocution if shock is severed or prolonged. Electrical burns. Fire due to electrical sparks or overheating of appliances. Secondary injuries by falling due to shock, electrical terminology. Current, the movement of electrical charge. Resistance, opposition to current flow. 
Voltage, a measure of electrical force. Conductors, substances, such as metals, that have little resistance to electricity. Insulators, substances, such as wood, rubber, glass, and bakelite, that have high resistance to electricity. Grounding, a conductive connection to the earth which acts as a protective measure, electrical circuit. Current, the movement of electrical charge in the conductor. Resistance, opposition to current flow. Voltage, a measure of electrical force or pressure. V equals I dot R. Voltage equals current X resistance, electrical shock. Shock is received when current passes through the body. Severity of the shock depends on Path of current through the body Amount of current flowing through the body Length of time the body is in the circuit Low voltage does not mean low hazard, electrical shocks are happening two ways. When two wires have different potential differences, voltages, current will flow if they are connected together. In most household wiring, the black wires are at 110 volts relative to ground. The white wires are at 0 volts because they are connected to ground. If you encounter an energized, live, black wire, and you are also in contact with the white grounded wire, current will pass through your body and you will receive a shock, electrical burns. Most common shock related, non-fatal injury occurs when you touch electrical wiring or equipment that is improperly used or maintained. Typically occurs on the hands. Very serious injury that needs immediate attention. Secondary injuries. Workers are getting the electrical shocks, but all shocks are not deadly. If during the shock muscle are not contracted, usually victim falls as a result of shock. This fall may be from height or on a dangerous machine or equipment that may result is serious injuries. If workers are working near or over water, they may fall in water and drown, fire hazards. Poor electrical power arrangement may provide the ignition source to the combustible or flammable materials. Overloading of electrical power distributing systems may cause fire. Loose and improper connection can produce the sparks and may ignite the material in its vicinity. Precautions These devices shut off electricity flow in the event of an overload or ground fault in the circuit. Includes fuses, circuit breakers, and ground fault circuit interrupters, GFCIs, also called RCD. Fuses and circuit breakers are overcurrent protection devices. When there is too much current, fuses melt. Circuit breakers drip open, GFCI or RCD. Ground fault current interrupter or residual current devices. This device protects you from dangerous shock. The GFCI detects a difference in current between the black and white circuit wires. This could happen when electrical equipment is not working correctly, causing current leakage known as a ground fault. If a ground fault is detected, the GFCI can shut off electricity flow in as little as 140 of a second, protecting you from a dangerous shock, grounding. Metal parts of an electrical wiring system that we touch, switch plates, ceiling light fixtures, conduit, etc., should be at zero volts relative to ground. Housings of motors Appliances or tools that are plugged into improperly grounded circuits may become energized. If you encounter an improperly grounded electrical device, you will be shocked. Isolation of power. The most effective and fail proof safe method of working on the electrical power are to isolate. Isolate the power wherever applicable by lockout tagout, LOTO. Lotto is applied on those equipment where power supply is not under your direct control, but you want to work on electrical equipment, training and awareness. Train employees working with electric equipment in safe work practices, including the energizing electric equipment before inspecting or making repairs. Using electric tools that are in good repair. 
using good judgment when working near energized lines. Using appropriate protective equipment and follow the manufacturer instructions. Common Causes of Fires Deliberate Acts by People Arson Children Playing with Matches Misuse or Neglect of Electrical Equipment Portable Heaters Careless Disposal of Smokers Materials Careless Use of Cooking Equipment Faulty Cooking Equipment Hot Works Work Equipment Fire safety, three stages. Furry prevention. This is the first stage, and we take care and control of all those elements those can make fire. We put safety measure that fire will not start. Housekeeping risk assessment. Ensure that materials and ignition sources are not come in contact. Fire detection. This is the second stage of control. If we fail at the first stage, then we need to have effective and fast detection system. Immediate control and suppression arrangement to minimize the property as well person losses, evacuation of workplace. If we cannot contain and control the fire the next stage is to evacuate the workplace to minimize the loss of lives. We shall have sufficient exit doors, stairs and corridors to handle the number of personnel to escape. This needs an assembly point at safe location. Fire extinguishers, water. Red indicator panel. Suitable for use on Class A fires, paper, wood, textiles and fabrics. Not suitable for combustible liquids, cooking fats. Not safe to use on fires involving electricity. Extinguishes the fire by cooling, fire extinguishers, foam. Off-white indicator panel. Suitable for Class A and B fires. Not suitable for use on fires involving electricity. Extinguishes by smothering and sealing the surface of a burning liquid, fire extinguishers, CO2. Black indicator panel. Best on Class B fires. 
safe to use on fires involving electricity. Extinguishes by reducing oxygen levels and smothering. Not to be used in confined areas, can cause asphyxiation, fire extinguishers, dry chemical powder. Blue indicator panel. Best on Class B fires but safe to use on any type of fire. Extinguishes by chemically interfering with the combustion. Do not use in a confined area due to inhalation hazard, fire extinguishers, wet chemical. Yellow indicator panel. Specifically designed for use on cooking oil, fat fires. Can be used on Class A fires. Extinguishes by smothering and cooling. A fine nozzle creates a mist spray which reacts with the oil slash fat. Do not use on electrical fires, fire extinguishers, fire blanket. Label is usually red or white. For use on any type of fire but best on small contained class B fires. Extinguishes by smothering. Normally used in kitchens. One use only. Information on fire extinguishers. Type of extinguisher. Method of operation. Class of fire suitable for use. Service maintenance date. All extinguishers should be inspected monthly by a competent person, and carry out major maintenance annually. Potency rating. For example, an ABC fire extinguisher might have a L rating of 48 80 BC. But what do these fire extinguisher ratings mean? The number in front of the A equal to 1.25 gallons of water, a fire extinguisher rating of 4A has an equivalent of 5 gallons of water to battle Class A fires. The number in front of the B illustrates a relative measurement of how much square footage the extinguisher can cover. Last word B, C and K These letters indicate that an extinguisher can be used effectively against these fire classes, operating a fire extinguisher. Check the pressure is OK for extinguisher, and it is right extinguisher for the type of fire. Note, keep in mind that most type of extinguishers have discharge range from 8-12 feet. Pull the pin to break the seal. Aim the nozzle at the base of fire. Squeeze the handle, lever, slowly. Sweep from side to side on the fire operating fire extinguishers, action in the event of fire. On hearing the alarm, do. Attempt to fight the fire only if you have been trained. Operate the nearest call point. Leave the building by your nearest available exit. Ensure all doors are closed behind you if you are the last. One to leave the room. Report to the assembly point. Report any person not accounted for to the person. Undertaking the roll call. Only re-enter when told it is safe to do so by the fire service. On hearing the alarm, do not. Do not delay evacuation for any reason, including to collect personal belongings. Do not use lifts. Use the stairs to evacuate. The lift may open directly onto the fire or may become inoperable as a consequence of the fire. Do not take any risk, personal safety. Only attempt to fight a fire if the alarm has been raised. The emergency services have been contacted. The fire is not spreading and is confined. You have a clear escape route not threatened by fire. You have selected the correct extinguisher. You have received practical training, it is bigger than a waste paper bin size, rule of thumb. You need more than one extinguisher. The room is filling with smoke. You do not have a clear escape route. Gas cylinders or chemicals are involved. Your efforts are not reducing the size of the fire. You do not have the correct extinguisher. You have not been trained to use a fire extinguisher. Fire assembly point. On arrival, all staff and visitors must be accounted for. Someone must be nominated to be in charge of the assembly point. Signing in records and visitors books must be taken to the fire assembly point for this use. Gather the information to be reported to the fire service when they arrive.
mandatory to apply. Isolation of energy is applied on all sources of energy those have potential to harm the worker and source of energy is not under direct control of the worker, energy and control. All types of energies are hazard, and they are posing different types of risks depending on their use. If energies are used under controlled environment, they are doing a lot of work for us, but it energy becomes uncontrolled. They can create catastrophic incident, that could lead to personal injuries or property damage. Therefore it is highly imperative to control the energy where it is necessary and there is a chance of getting out of control and harm the workers. If we are working on an equipment, a worker has potential of harm by the power or energy, it is legal requirement to isolate the equipment from power. This isolation is achieved by a safety control called lockout tagout, LOTO. Purpose of Lotto To protect workers from the release of hazardous energy, and To guard against the accidental startup of equipment during service and maintenance, sources of energy Typical sources of energy that may need to be isolated, locked and tagged out include Electrical for example electric motors batteries hydraulic for example pressurized fluids in hoses pipes pneumatic for example pressurized air in hoses pipes mechanical for example gravity systems or spring energy chemical for example storage vessels or pipelines containing toxic hazardous chemicals and hydrocarbon petrol products Thermal for example hot oil lines used to heat heavy fuel oil tanks, pipe work. Pressurized liquids, gases for example hydrocarbons, petrol, steam, various isolation of energy. Isolation of electrical energy. Lockout tag out, LOTO, of main switch. Removal of circuit breaker. Isolation of hazardous fluids, health hazard and physical hazards. Removal of pipe section, line breaking. Removal of valve to stop the flow of fluid. Blinding of flange. All these ways to do the isolation is called positive isolation of energy, standard requirement. Only a facility manager or their delegates can authorize isolation work. Determine the equipment to be isolated in the job planning and risk assessment stage. An equipment isolation checklist is required to be completed whenever equipment with multiple isolation points is to be isolated for work. A general work permit is required for installation of any type of positive isolation, when should positive isolation, normally blinding is used, of equipment be considered. Whenever hot work is to be performed on the equipment. Whenever a piece of equipment in any type of hazardous service is to be removed from the job site. Whenever a tank, vessel or other equipment is to be isolated for confined space entry, lotto is used to ensure equipment to be worked on cannot be activated by locking out and tagging the equipment's power source. For electrically powered equipment its electrical breaker is to be opened, locked and tagged. Steam turbine drivers etc. shall have their steam inlet and outlet valves blocked and locks and tags installed, lock out and tag out should both be used, never use a tag alone. Test the equipment to ensure zero energy state. A six-hole hasp shall be installed at the equipment's primary isolation point, the primary isolation point is to be listed first on the equipment isolation point. Example, circuit breaker of electrical motors. If an isolation point cannot be locked out another isolation point further back in the system should be identified and lotto shall be performed there. Only the maintenance person who fitted a lock and tag is authorized to remove it. Locks, and tags, are normally to be installed in the following order. Operator lock. Electrician lock. Maintenance lock. Locks, and tags are to be removed in the following order. Maintenance lock. Electrician lock. Operator lock. Locks shall be used if it is feasible. Where applicable a facilities operations group should have individually keyed and numbered lock sets. 
Each authorized employee, contractor required to perform lotto should be issued with their own lockout locks and keys. Lockout locks should only be used for lotto purposes. Locks that are used for a lockout and tagout cannot be used for any other purposes. Always use a six-hold hasp to install the lock, and the last hole on the hasp to apply another hasp. Lotto tags are generally to be utilized in tandem with locks. Danger do not operate tags to be installed on any vents and or drains that are left open to atmosphere. Remember that tags only provide information and warnings to alert workers, they do not lock out an energy source. Tags shall provide warning to personnel not to energize the equipment. Tags should be of a suitably durable material for the work environment in which they are installed. Tag must securely fasten to prevent accidental removal using a sufficiently strong self-locking, non-reusable tie wrap. Tags shall provide warning to personnel not to energize the equipment. Tags should be of a suitably durable material for the work environment in which they are installed. Tag must securely fasten to prevent accidental removal using a sufficiently strong self-locking, non-reusable tie wrap. Tags are to be standard across facility and different in design from other types of tags used for other purposes. Tags must be made of a suitable weatherproof and when applicable heat-resistant material. Tags should be written in a language understood by the workforce or may be bilingual. Tags should be filled out using a permanent marker. Must identify who put the tag, the date installed, the equipment isolated and the reason it is being isolated. Tags may be color-coded to identify the discipline installing it. For example yellow operations, blue maintenance and red electrical or instrument technicians, do not rely on another person's lock and or tag, they may remove it without your knowledge, ensure your own lock and tag is installed on the six hole hasp. Maintenance or contractor locks and tags should only be removed by the person who installed them. Lotto is a control measure that is required as a part of the work permitting process. It should not be seen as superseding the need for a work permit. For further information and our instructions for the lockout and tagout system please refer to your company's general operating procedures slash standards slash guidelines covering lotto. Your company's safety officer. Introduction there are approximately 650,000 existing chemical products, and hundreds of new ones being introduced annually. Chemical exposure may cause or contribute to many serious health effects such as heart ailments, central nervous system damage, kidney and lung damage, sterility, cancer, burns, and rashes. Some chemicals may also be safety hazards and have the potential to cause fires and explosions. OSHA has COM standard. To ensure that employers and employees know about work hazards and how to protect themselves so that the incidence of illnesses and injuries due to hazardous chemicals is reduced, scope of the HASCOM. OSHA's hazard communication, HASCOM, standard applies to general industry, shipyard, marine terminals, longshoring, and construction employment and covers chemical manufacturers, importers, employers, and employees exposed to chemical hazards, employers' responsibilities. Identify and list hazardous chemicals in their workplaces. Obtain material safety data sheets, MSDSs, and labels for each hazardous chemical, if not provided by the manufacturer, importer, or distributor. Implement a written HASCOM program, including labels, MSDSs and employee training. Communicate hazard information to employees through labels, MSDSs, and formal training programs, reducing the risks. The first step in minimizing workplace risks is to perform a thorough risk assessment. Employers can rely on the evaluations performed by the manufacturers or importers to establish the risks of the chemicals they use. This information is obtained from MSDS and labels, 
Importance of Written Program Provides Necessary Hazard Information to Employees Ensures that all employers receive the information they need to inform and train their employees. Describes Container Labeling, MSDSs, and Employee Training for Each Workplace. List of the Hazardous Chemicals Make information regarding hazards and protective measures available to other employers on site. Information on labels. Each container of hazardous chemicals entering the workplace must be labeled or marked with Identity of the chemical. Appropriate hazard warnings. Name and address of the manufacturer or responsible party. The hazard warning can be any type of message, picture or symbol that provides information on the hazards of the chemicals and the targeted organs affected, if applicable. Labels must be legible, in English, plus other languages, if desired, and prominently displayed. Material Safety Data Sheet Prepared by the chemical manufacturer or importer and describe Physical hazards, such as fire and explosion Health hazards such as signs of exposure, routes of exposure, precautions for safe handling and use, emergency and first aid procedures, control measures, standard requirement, must be in English and include information regarding the specific chemical identity and common names, must provide information about the physical and chemical characteristics, health effects, Exposure limits, carcinogenicity, cancer causing, identification, name, address, and telephone number of the organization responsible for preparing the sheet must be readily accessible to employees in their work area. Material safety data sheet. MSDS have no prescribed format. If no MSDS has been received for a hazardous chemical, Employer must contact the supplier, manufacturer, or importer to obtain one and maintain a record of the contact, has come training. Training is required for employees who are exposed to hazardous chemicals in their work area. At the time of initial assignment, whenever a new hazard is introduced into their work area, explanation of the HASCOM program, including information on labels, MSDSs, and how to obtain and use available hazard information. Hazards of chemicals. Protective measures such as engineering controls, work practices, and the use of PPE. How to detect the presence or release of a hazardous chemical, using monitoring devices, observation, or smell, the HASCOM standard and its requirements. Operations in their work areas where hazardous chemicals are present. Location and availability of the written hazard evaluation procedures, communications program, lists of hazardous chemicals, and the required MSDS. Hierarchy of Control Employer's legal duty is to protect the workers from all type of risk that could harm the worker's health. Eliminate and reduce the risks by eliminating the hazards, reducing the risk by engineering, administrative controls. Employer is responsible to reduce the risks by all above means to the lowest level and lastly, he must provide the PPE to protect from residual risks. Hierarchy of Control Elimination slash substitution. Highest level of protection. Eliminate hazard from the workplace. Substitute. Use safer item, substance. Use same chemical but in a different form to reduce the risk. Engineering controls. Physical changes to workplace. Examples. Isolation. Ventilation. Equipment. Modification and others, administrative controls, work practice control, written proper operating procedures, work permits and safe work practices, inspection and maintenance, housekeeping, 
monitoring the use of highly hazardous materials. Supervision, training. Signs and warnings. Regulated areas. Limit exposure by time or distance. Basic mandatory PPE. Head protection, safety helmet. Protecting clothing, cover all. Eye protection safety glasses, hand protection, gloves. Foot protection, safety shoes. Hearing protection if high noise, earmuffs and earplugs, safety helmet. Head protection. Frequent causes of head injuries. Falling objects from above striking on the head. Bump head against fixed objects, such as exposed pipes or beams, or Accidental head contact with electrical hazards, do not paint or use solvent on hard hats. Check manufacture date before using, do not use hard hats more than 5 years. Replace the hard maximum 5 year or more frequent based on usage. Applicable standard for normal safety helmet is ANSI slash IZZ 89.1-2009, BS on 397, Types of Helmet Classes of Hard Hats Class G, General Protect against impact, penetration Low voltage electrical protection, proof tested to 2200 volts, Class E, Electrical Designed for electrical, utility work. Protect against falling objects, impact. Electrical protection against high voltage, proof tested to 20,000 volts, class C, conductive. Designed for comfort, offers limited protection. Protects heads that may bump against fixed objects. Does not protect against falling objects or electrical hazards, helmet standard. ANSI Z89.1, 1997 Type I, provides protection from objects fall directly on top of the helmet, but not from objects that strike the side, front, or back of the head. Type II, provides protection from strikes to the top of the head and also provides protection from blows to the sides, front, and back of the head. More suitable for workers who are not always in a standing position. Eye and face protection. Common causes of eye injuries. Chemical splashes. Blood or chemical splashes or sprays. Intense light. Dust and other flying particles. Molten metal splashes, eye and face protection. The eye and face protection comply to the following standard. ANSI Z87.1 2015. EN 166 or BSN 166. Used to protect. Against moderate impacts from particles, selecting eye and face protection, elements to consider. Ability to protect against workplace hazards should fit properly should provide unrestricted vision and movement durable and cleanable allow unrestricted functioning of other PPE prescription glasses employees who use prescription glasses while performing operations with potential eye hazards must use eye protection that incorporates the prescription in its design or can be used over your prescription glasses without interfering with the proper positioning of the prescription glasses or goggles. Goggles protect eyes and the facial area immediately surrounding the eyes from impact, dust, splashes. Some can be used over corrective lenses, if they fit them, face shields. Protect face from nuisance dusts and potential splashes or sprays of hazardous liquids. Shields do not protect from impact hazards unless so rated. Shields are for face protection, not eye protection. To protect the eyes, wear safety glasses with side shields, or goggles under the face shield, welding shields. Protect eyes from burns caused by infrared light, intense radiant light, 
protect eyes and face from flying sparks, metal spatter, and slag chips, foot protection safety shoes. Causes of foot injuries Falling or rolling of heavy objects Crushing or penetrating materials Sharp objects that can penetrate the soul Exposure to molten metal Working on, or around, hot, wet, or slippery surfaces Working when electrical hazards are present Meeting the standard, ANSI 41.1 latest version New approvals are under ASTM F2413 NISO 20345-2011 Conditions requiring foot protection Impacts Compressions Cuts, punctures Chemicals Temperatures Electrical shocks When selecting safety shoes consider the risks to the workers, protection from hazards Shoes with metal toe cap protects against knocks, falling objects. Steel midsole protects from nails and sharp object puncturing. Rubber shoes protect against chemical materials, as directed by the SDS. Some examples of foot and leg protection. Impact resistant toe and or instep steel. Composite. Heat resistant soles. Metal shanks. Specialty footwear may be needed. Metatarsal guards. Liquid or chemical resistant. Conductive or non-conductive, hand protection. Potential hazards for hands. Skin absorption of hazardous substances. Lacerations or severe cuts. Punctures. Chemical burns. Thermal burns. Extreme temperatures, cover all or body protection. Provide protective clothing for those parts of the body exposed to possible injuries. Types of body protection. Laboratory coats. Coveralls. Vests. Jackets. Aprons. Full body suits. Working clothing have different standards for different jobs. Special PPE if applicable. Types of respirators. Air purifying, APR, dash remove contaminants from air. Particulate respirators. Chemical cartridge slash gas mask respirator. Powered air purifying respirator, PAPR, atmosphere supplying air, provide clean, breathable air from atmosphere. ASR takes the clean air form atmosphere and through hose network supply the air to the worker. Used for long working hours, supplied air respirator, self-contained breathing air. Takes the air from already air-filled cylinders or containers and supply the clean air to the worker. Its time limited is from 15 minutes to 2 hours. Additional cylinder may extend the time duration. Physical fitness before using RPE. Medical evaluation. Before fit tests are conducted and employee is authorized the use of a respirator, a medical evaluation must be providing to determine the ability of the employee to use a respirator. Identify a physician or other licensed healthcare professional, PLHCP, to perform medical evaluations using a medical questionnaire or an initial medical evaluation with which the same information is obtained. Respiratory Program Elements of a Respiratory Program A written plan detailing how the program is managed. Risk Assessment of Respiratory Hazards in the Workplace An Employee Training Program Covering Hazard Recognition the dangers associated with respiratory hazards, and proper care and use of respiratory protective equipment. Inspection, maintenance, and repair of respiratory protective equipment. Medical surveillance of employees, where necessary. Implementation of the control. Eliminate the hazard. Reduce the risk or substitute with less hazardous substance. Engineering controls. Safety system of work and administrative. Selection of PPE for the protection for respiration, summary. 
safety officers are a bridge between the management and workers. They are helping the management to apply the safety rules and regulation, and they guide the workers to do the work safely. Health and Safety Management System is an effective tool to control the workplace hazard and improve the workplace safety. Safety officers must be aware of the way how the HSMS is working and they may help the management to implement the system when asked by the managers. Other requirements for the safety officer that he must be knowledgeable about in following subjects. Electrical safety, general workplace safety, how to do the safety inspections, how to control the energy, correct selection and use of PPE. Special program for the respiratory program and use of RPE.